Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, our global look at the top stories in the coming week from our Daybreak anchors all around the world. And straight ahead on the program, a preview of core U.S. PCE prices and GDP, also earnings from the U.S.'s biggest EV maker. I'm Tom Busby in New York. I'm Stephen Carroll in London, where we're discussing what's in store for Europe's biggest banks as earnings season gets underway. I'm Brian Curtis in Hong Kong. We look forward to what's referred to as Auto Show China in the coming week. Is it about the cars or the politics? That's all straight ahead on Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend on Bloomberg 1130 New York, Bloomberg 991 Washington, D.C., Bloomberg 1061 Boston, Bloomberg 960 San Francisco, DAB Digital Radio London, Sirius XM 119, and around the world on BloombergRadio.com and via the Bloomberg Business app. Good day to you. I'm Tom Busby, and we begin today's program with a look at key economic data here in the U.S. On Thursday, we get core PCE for March, GDP data for the first quarter of this year. What will this mean for the Fed's monetary policy going forward? Well, for more, we're joined by Stuart Paul, U.S. economist with Bloomberg Economics. Stuart, the PCE price index, the preferred measure of inflation for the Fed, What do you expect to see for March? We're expecting to see the headline PCE price index show about 0.3% growth month on month. The core, which is more illustrative of what's going on in the actual economy, strips out energy, strips out food. We're expecting to see the core rise about the same 0.3% month on month. And that's going to allow just a very slight moderation in the annual measure of core PCE inflation. We're expecting about 2.7% annual PCE inflation. A big part of that inflation pressure is coming from core services in particular. And if we drill down and look underneath the hood of what's going on, we see insurance products are really helping to drive that inflationary pressure. Auto insurance, homeowners insurance, everything? That's right. So auto insurance, home insurance, and we're seeing those prices rise in large part because of rising prices that we saw for autos and homes post-pandemic. So when the replacement cost of autos and when construction costs rise for homes, for example, so too do the insurance premiums that people have to pay. So this is sort of a residual effect from the inflation that we've already seen in the past. But that's not the full story. The fact that people can afford to pay those higher premiums is, again, just downstream of the fact that the economy continues chugging along and people are doing relatively well. And we're going to see that exact same thing in the personal income data that we get at the same time. We're going to see March personal income growth of about 0.6%. Again, it's just too hot for the Fed. It's too hot for uh, the Fed to have confidence that inflation pressures are truly waning. Well, uh, we've seen wage growth, and we've seen the labor market to an upside surprise almost every month. Well, certainly every month this year. How could it not? That's right. The the labor market has been resilient. We saw just in the month of March, 303,000 jobs added. We saw an increase in the number of hours worked on average. We saw wages rising on an hourly basis. And to our best estimate, employee compensation, so that's both salaries and other additional benefits. Our best estimate is that uh, employee compensation rose about 0.8% during the month. That is a hot labor market. That is really helping to buoy spending. And that PCE spending that we're going to see is probably going to be on the order of about 0.7%. Retail sales was hot, and we're expecting to see the same thing in March PCE spending. Let's talk about then the other reading that we'll get on Thursday, and that is economic growth. What do you expect to see? This is an initial reading for the first quarter of this year. We're very likely to see robust growth to start the year. I'm estimating 2.5% real GDP growth. That's on an annualized basis in the first quarter. That's really supported, again, by consumer spending, which is creating that inflationary impulse, but about 2.9% annualized consumer spending growth on a real basis in the first quarter is very impressive. Fixed investment, a bit weak. Investment is really coming from residential investment because of a bit of a housing shortage, because people are staying in their homes, they locked in low rates. So we have a little bit of a housing shortage with very low inventories. And a lot of investment in intellectual property, right? This is all downstream of the AI boom and people really looking to improve the the software and intellectual property that they have uh, so that they could take advantage of that. Let's go back to housing. 
and the challenges, not just home buying, but also rents, surprisingly, a little higher. Uh, I mean, how is that affecting things for, for the overall GDP? So the the fact that rent prices are up is not directly uh, pushing GDP one way or another. But the fact that rents are up is encouraging additional investment in housing, right? There is clearly a shortage of a housing stock. People who are homeowners are not listing their homes because the average rate being paid on mortgages, not new originations, but existing mortgages, is still below 4%, right? So the fact that homes are not turning over encourages more construction of rental units, which is providing growth in the form of residential fixed investment. And so we are getting some of those tailwinds again. You know, Rent prices are a signal. They're a signal to builders that uh, we need more construction. And I think that that's going to show up a bit in residential fixed investment in the Q1 GDP numbers. Well, let's hope. So you have a rather upbeat outlook for the GDP. PCE leveling off a little bit, 2.7% on an annualized basis, which is, it's not 2%, but it's getting there. Add it all up. The Fed's coming up a meeting later this month, the 30th and May 1st. What do you think is going through their heads? What, what is the FOMC thinking with all this? I think here are really the three items that the Fed is looking at that they need to synthesize into a monetary policy view. Growth has remained robust, and there is a bit of momentum there. The labor market has been tight. And that's created upward pressure on wages. And inflation, yes, ticking down a little bit, certainly not at the 2% target. And it's that disinflation progress is stalling out. So you have robust growth, tight labor market, and stalling disinflation progress. That's going to allow the Fed to keep their foot on the brakes a little bit longer. I think that as we get to June, we might end up seeing a revision to the famous FOMC dot plot, which shows monetary policy makers' forecast for where rates are going to go. Right now, they're showing 75 basis points of cuts in this year, in 2024. I think that the risk is really toward uh, a revision where even policymakers have to admit they're not going to be able to cut rates as much as they once thought. Yeah, maybe not 75, but we may see something by the end of this year. 50, 25, 25, it's possible, but then we're getting close to the end of the year and we're getting close to election season, and it gets really difficult to navigate both political and economic conditions. Oh, oh boy. A lot to look forward to. Well, that March PCE, Q1 GDP out this coming Thursday. And our thanks to Stuart Paul, U.S. economist with Bloomberg Economics. Well, we turn now to the first quarter earnings season with a ton of big reports this week. One company, though, getting a lot of attention, the world's most valuable electric automaker, Tesla, posting its latest results on Tuesday. And for more on what we can expect and all the challenges that Tesla is facing, we're joined by Steve Mann, Bloomberg Intelligence Global Autos and Industrials Research Analyst. Now, Steve, let's start with what you expect to see with the results, and then we'll get into everything else with Tesla. So what do you expect to see on Tuesday? Oh, it's uh, it's not going to be pretty for Tesla. They've announced they cut 10% of their workforce. And, you know, they announced that right at the beginning of the second quarter. So it, it may be signaling that things are a lot worse than the street anticipated, maybe a lot worse than what they anticipated. So, you know, first quarter earnings, not going to be pretty. You know, we're, we're thinking it's, you know, based on a scenario analysis, likely a miss versus consensus. And... We've seen a few misses from a Tesla lately. Uh, we saw deliveries missed. Uh, well, you know, there's a laundry list of things we could talk about. And we'll also talk about some of the good things. So, well, let's get more on those job cuts. 10% uh, of its workforce, 14,000 jobs worldwide. Like you said, not a good sign. Not a sign of confidence for employees or for investors, is it? No, no. And, and interestingly, they actually raised prices in the U.S. and they cut incentives in China. So, you know, I think during the earnings call, it's going to be a huge earnings call for Tesla. And hopefully they're they're prepared for that. Um, They're going to have to set, you know, real expectations for the investors and how to move forward. Because, you know, they cut prices uh, earlier this month. You know, the fear is that they're going to reverse it. If they do, you know, we're going to probably see more downgrades on the stock. Earnings downgrade and ratings downgrade by the street. And that's about 40% just year to date, right, on that stock? Yeah, 40%. Um, no, they're not alone at this. Uh, this is an industry-wide issue, particularly in the U.S., more so in the U.S., but we're seeing it globally as well. I think the early adopters for EVs have pretty much tapped out 
right? A lot of the EVs today that are offered today, especially in, in the West, in Europe, and as well in the US, they're well above $50,000 per vehicle. Above $50,000, you're pretty much at the premium and luxury segment. So the market for that segment is relatively small. What we're also looking for Tesla to talk about in their earnings, it's, it's their next model. It's dubbed the Model 2. It's a compact, subcompact vehicle, supposedly under $30,000. It's a critical product, not just for Tesla, but for the market. Because like I said earlier, the luxury segment is pretty much tapped out. So we need to bring in new buyers for battery electric vehicles. And more affordable EVs is really what the market needs right now. Now, there were reports that that Model 2 production had been delayed. Uh, Tesla denied those reports, but where is it? Uh, they have said the robo-taxi is coming August 8th, right? But uh, I think, like you said, most people want to see a more affordable car. Yeah, that Model 2 is critical for, for Tesla. It, it's interesting. I'm still optimistic. I think you know they've already spent a lot of money, made a lot of investment in uh, developing that Model 2 you know, and they were scheduled to actually launch that uh, at the end of 2025. You know, it's not that far away, um, given that it takes multi years to develop a, a new car. So for them to scrap it pretty much almost the last minute, it's kind of unheard of. So now, you know, Elon Musk did come out on Twitter or on X to say that the, uh, the reporting on cancellation of Model 2 is false. Uh, I hope that's that's the case. But in the fourth quarter announcement, earnings announcement, he did mention that this Model 2 will be launched at the end of 2025 and that the production actually will start in the U.S. and then expand into Mexico. Uh, hopefully, it's really not a cancellation of the Model 2, the subcompact compact vehicle. Maybe there's some you know, hurdles that they need to get through in building that plant in Mexico. And that's probably, hopefully that's probably what it is. Well, a lot to look forward to. Tesla's first quarter results coming out after the close this Tuesday. And our thanks to Steve Mann, Bloomberg Intelligence, Global Autos and Industrials Research Analyst. Coming up on Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, we'll look at what's in store for Europe's biggest banks as earnings season gets underway there. I'm Tom Busby, and this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, our global look ahead at the top stories for investors in the coming week. I'm Tom Busby in New York. Up later in our program, a look at the 2024 Beijing International Automotive Exhibition. But first, it's earnings season for Europe's biggest banks, and hotter-than-expected inflation in Europe could put its central banks in a difficult position as far as plans to lower interest rates. Higher for longer may not be the mantra that the markets want to hear, but for Europe's biggest lenders, it could prove lucrative. For more, let's go to London and bring in Bloomberg Daybreak Europe anchor Stephen Carroll. Tom, high interest rates have been the key profit driver for European banks over the past year. In 2023, elevated borrowing costs saw the combined net income of the 20 biggest continental European banks exceed 100 billion euros for the first time. According to Bloomberg data, three quarters of the lenders in the group achieved their highest profits ever. Barclays, Deutsche Bank and BNP Paribas are just some of the names reporting results in the coming days. As markets are staring down the barrel of an even longer period of high interest rates, many will be hoping to emulate last year's success. But that may be difficult as the tailwinds attached to high rates begin to fade. Analysts surveyed by Bloomberg expect the combined net income for 11 of Europe's biggest banks to fall by 6.3% this year. But that would still make 2024 the second most profitable year for more than two decades. Now JP Morgan's research team is reassessing its initially wary outlook on the sector, admitting their cautious approach was not the right decision. But uncertainty over the rate path is a cloud on the horizon. Markets are expecting the European Central Bank to cut rates for the first time in June, but the trajectory after that looks more uncertain. We've been discussing this with Klaus Bader, Global Chief Economist at Société Générale. He says that borrowing costs will start to come down slowly. 
And the ECB, we see three interest rate cuts, which is, you know, a pretty slow pace. So cut in June, a cut in September, cut in December, which would uh, which would coincide with uh, updates to the staff projections that uh, the ECB has. So it's certainly uh, not a, it's a, it's a gradual cut. And by the way, all of those reductions, we expect them to be by 25 basis points. So it's certainly a much slower pace on the way down than than on the way up. And uh, for the Bank of England, it's uh, it's fairly similar. But you know, one one big difference between the Bank of England and the ECB, of course, is that the Bank of England has rates interest rates much more drastically than the ECB and. The UK economy is really quite sensitive to interest rates because of the structure of its mortgage market, where even though now most uh, mortgage rates are fixed, um, they're fixed for a relatively short period of time. In drastic contrast, for instance, to Germany or the Netherlands and uh, other countries in Europe where you have very long fixed rate uh, deals. And so the sensitivity of interest rates there is small. So I would say that uh, the Bank of England is likely at least over no, considerable, let's say six or nine months, is likely to reduce interest rates at a somewhat faster clip than the ECB will. How worried do ECB policymakers need to be about a Fed that, that may not be cutting rates as you see it this year? You know, of course, central bankers will always tell you, you know, we're independent and uh, we we have our brief and our brief is to do with our domestic economy. Um I think that the connection between central bank policies, first and foremost, comes to the exchange rate. Now, the euro is already relatively weak. If you've got an inflation problem, that's not a good thing. But uh, if inflation in the euro area is going to slow, then um, I think the ECB is going to have a a reasonably high degree of tolerance for a weaker exchange rate um, and um, therefore will not be particularly fast. But, you know, clearly, if the Fed was cutting interest rates quickly, there would be more scope for the ECB to reduce interest rates as well. I think that's uh, that's very clear. Um, but um, what I've been a bit surprised about is that um, the ECB's portrayal of uh, the inflation picture isn't is not completely in line the way I see it. I have to say. So that was Klaus Bader, Global Chief Economist at Société Générale in London, speaking to us on Bloomberg Radio. What does all of this mean for those big European banking names reporting in this earnings season? I've been discussing that with Bloomberg Opinion's Global Banking columnist, Paul J. Davies. The really fascinating thing that we saw at full year earnings that we didn't expect was the the southern European banks, you know, the the Santander's, Unicredit especially, uh, those in sort of Spain and Italy really kind of outperformed. They did so much better than people were expecting. Normally, these banks they have kind of they have much shorter duration loans on their books. They react much more quickly to interest rates, and people were expecting them to sort of fall off quicker. But in fact, it was the other way around. Those with the the more northern European, some of the French, BNP, uh, German, Dutch banks didn't do so well at all. They kind of missed their earnings and, and, and revenue expectations. So it's like, and I think there's a sense that that's going to continue, even though we're expecting rate cuts to come, obviously. I think the curves have remained relatively steep, and that's really good for these these southern European banks. So we'll see, we'll see a bit more of that, probably. Because, I mean, this is, of course, in the context of when we're looking ahead to an expected cut from the ECB in June. Are you suggesting that that's going to kind of have quite divergent effects across the European banking sector then when when we're kind of look, listening out to what banks are going to be telling us by their outlook? Yeah, I mean, when the cuts do start to come in, then obviously it will affect those southern European banks quickest because their loans reset faster. Later on in the year, we might see their earnings expectations start to drop away, depending on exactly what cuts materialise and what the outlook is for, for how many more cuts are going to come. And then that's when the more defensive, you know, the northern Europeans with with much longer duration mortgage books and and things like this who will have more of you know the recent sort of higher rates lasting for longer in their in their lending that's when they will look better but it obviously depends on why we're cutting rates and how far we're cutting rates and if we're moving into something that looks a lot more recessionary then that's obviously kind of bad for banks in general and we'll be starting to worry about you know bad debts and, and provisions and that sort of thing creeping up. 
Yeah, because I mean, looking at the the stock six hundred banks in, bank index up over ten percent since the start of the year, so high borrowing costs have been you know helping to lift those as well. Is Goldman Sachs right in describing the future of European banks as better for longer? Well, again, it depends on what rate cuts we have and and what the outlook is for why they're happening. I mean, I mean, if you look at European banks alone, if you look at the the Euro stocks fifty, the banks in there to so exclude the UK banks, mm. then actually the performance has been even better. And one of the drivers there has been. You know, some of the bigger banks, BNP has sold businesses, Unicredit has had years and years of fixing its balance sheets and the benefit of that has is, is been coming through. And what that has meant is there's been this wave of you know, much larger than normal, much larger than anything in the last decade or so kind of share buybacks coming through. So, so investors have looked at sort of you know, reasonably good earnings, you know, reasonable hopes for those earnings lasting a little bit longer, and this wave of buybacks coming through. And that's what supported a lot of the European banks, but probably even more than some of the UK banks, to be honest. What about investment banking and all of this as well? What are the sort of hopes that these banks have in that sector? Yeah, well, this is where it's. Um, this is where they are being kind of way more optimistic than is warranted. I think. I mean, we've just had all of the big U.S. banks reporting. There was a jump in uh, investment banking fees, and a lot of this was driven by kind of bond issuance and loan issuance by sort of you know the debt capital market side of things. The M and A business is still really, really struggling now. So good debt market business is going to be good for Deutsche Bank. It's going to be good for Barclays. That's historically where they've where they've done well. But you know, Barclays especially BNP also and to some degree Deutsche have like they have like really quite bullish expectations for what investment banking revenues are going to do over the next few years in terms of what they're promising shareholders the returns they're going to make you know for Barclays the capital returns they're going to fund and this sort of thing and really it's like the investment banking recovery isn't looking that strong yet it's looking like it's still going to be quite a tricky quite a bumpy year in many ways and where it is good is going to be much more US focused so I'm kind of very sceptical that a lot of these Europeans are going to hit the kind of targets that they're setting. So is it the banks that have a greater US investment bank business and that are more likely to outperform in this sector? Yeah, so I mean, so Barclays obviously with a lot more US exposure perhaps will do better than than BNP or or Deutsche on that front. But again, it's like the, the expectations that they have involve taking market share from somebody else. And the question is, well, who is that somebody else? I mean, they're not going to take it from the Americans, not that easily anyway. You know, obviously Credit Suisse blew up and is gone. You know, any market share to be had from then has probably been already distributed. So then the question is, you know, where do you get it from? I mean, there's an argument that there are some smaller European banks who are going to find it increasingly difficult to maintain maintain those investment banking services in any sort of, you know, cost effective or, or competitive fashion. But again, they don't account for a lot of the business. So there's not, like a, not a lot of share to be taken from, from them, even if they do give up and go away. So it's really difficult to see, you know, how these big Europeans really kind of do anything better than what the market does. We've been discussing the differing outlooks for interest rates between the US and Europe after the recent comments from Jerome Powell signalling a later start to rate cuts in the US. Does the the currency divergence that that could provoke, is that going to have an impact on, on banks' outlooks? I mean, again, certainly. I mean, I think it's like, you know, for the US, we're almost certainly into a world of, you know, higher rates for longer, more upward volatility in both rates and inflation rather than kind of downward volatility, i.e., you know, we're going to continue to see if rates do move or if, if there is questions over the path of rates, it's going to be flat to up rather than suddenly down. In Europe, it's a very different world. It's, you know, it's lower growth generally, it's lower productivity, there's like, there's more kind of trade and supply chain issues for Europe than there are for the US. And there are some people, and I, I kind of hadn't decided quite whether I agree with them yet or not, but there are some people who really think that actually the volatility in Europe is going to be downwards. It's going to be inflation undershooting expectations more quickly than we might think, rates having to drop to below sort of 2% again more quickly than we might think as well. And that is bad for trading activity. You know, we could be entering a stage where actually Europe and the US start to diverge quite a bit. And again, that will favour the big US banks over the big European banks when it comes to investment banking and trading too. What about jobs and pay and all of this as well? You've written extensively about UBS after the the Credit Suisse takeover. We've been reporting on the most recent round of uh, job cuts expected at UBS as well. What is the outlook for those working in these banks in terms of both the security of their jobs, but also how much they should be expecting in bonuses. Well, again, I mean, it depends a lot on what happens with the economy. I think in the US, it's, it's obviously looking better, apart from, I mean, if you're an M&A banker, 
you know, you're still not getting the kind of activity that you that will see you earning, you know, fabulous money. You know, the boutiques who also pay their bankers a greater share of the revenue they make because they don't have all of the rest of the costs are also kind of taking away bits of business. So we're talking like, you know, the, the Evercores, the PJTs, the Lazards, you know, those sorts of banks, uh, those sorts of investment banks. It's a much trickier world. But again, it's sort of, you know, to the extent that there looks like there could be a recovery, it's going to be more US based than, than Europe based. So, so those people will, people focus on the US will earn more. But I mean, I guess, and we've got a big, a big take about this on Bloomberg about, you know, the private equity industry and the lack of activity there. This is a huge business for investment banking. They, you know, historically supply up to 30% of all investment banking fees across the board in terms of M&A advice, debt issuance, equity issuance, and so on and so forth. And until that industry can kind of find its mojo again, can find reasons and value in doing deals, then investment banking is going to disappoint. And so, you know, the job requirements and the bonus requirements for a lot of people may well disappoint as well. Thanks to Bloomberg Opinions' Paul J. Davies. We will bring you those bank results on Bloomberg Radio as they're released in the coming days. I'm Stephen Carroll in London. You can catch us every weekday morning here for Bloomberg Daybreak Europe, beginning at 6am in London and 1am on Wall Street. Tom? Thank you, Stephen. And coming up on Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, a look at the 2024 Beijing International Automotive Exhibition. I'm Tom Busby, and this is Bloomberg. I'm Tom Busby with your global look ahead at the top stories for investors in the coming week. This week is the Auto Show China, the 2024 Beijing International Automotive Exhibition. Bloomberg Daybreak Asia host Brian Curtis and Doug Krisner take a look at China's electric vehicle market and how international automakers are reacting to China's dominance in that space. Tom, we look forward to Auto Show China, the 2024 Beijing International Automotive Exhibition. Legacy European automakers will be revving up a last-ditch offensive to win back some of the EV market. And the Chinese brands will be showing off their latest models. For sure, BMW is showcasing an unprecedented 15 models. A slew of BMW executives will be attending. Mercedes CEO is attending as well. And Volkswagen will also bring a number of its high ranking executives. This show comes at a time of heightened tensions between Beijing and the West over low-cost manufacturing in China. And we thought the auto show as a result would be a good prism through which to look at some of these issues, the still growing domestic auto market in China, but also the global auto market, EU tensions with China over cheap Chinese autos, uh, U.S.-China issues as well, some of the travails that Tesla is facing. And what happens if and when Chinese manufacturers set up shop in Mexico as they eye the big U.S. market? Joining us in our studios in Hong Kong are Bloomberg Transport reporters Linda Liu and Danny Lee. And first, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz has been in China over the past week and has drawn some attention to this issue that Doug mentioned, overcapacity of EVs in China flooding European markets. We asked Bloomberg correspondent Rebecca Chong-Wilkins to characterize the Chinese response to such criticism. EVs are part of this whole uh, channel and, and plan to replace the old drivers of growth. If we do see this kind of friction, this trade friction, that does have a potential to significantly impact the ability uh, for these industries to continue developing uh, because because exporting is a big part of the the plan. That's Rebecca Chung-Wilkins. So, Danny, this show, which you'll be attending, and Linda will as well, is about cars. Will it be about the cars or the politics? It will be about making sure that Germany's auto production uh, is not harmed by the rise of Chinese EVs, ultimately. Uh, As much as it is about the cars, the automotive show on display, but there is still a sense of geopolitics and economy as well, you know, given how much the, the, you know, the automotive market really contributes to the German economy. And you know, you've seen these successful brands over many, many decades. You see them in China today, the fact that you know, BMW, uh, Mercedes, you know, they, count, uh, they count China as being their biggest market in some shape or form, whether it be on revenue or on sales. So it's very important. And when you see the rise of Chinese EVs in particular, what you're seeing is 
then having to reposition themselves against the rise of Chinese EVs. But we've not necessarily, necessarily seen an impact yet of, of, on revenues or on sales in particular, but that is, is bracing themselves for what is you know, an interesting and fascinating long-term battle for supremacy and relevance in not just China, but what will be the global market. When I think of the early days of the auto industry in China, I think joint venture. Both American and European partners establishing these JVs. And clearly, I think we can agree that Chinese firms did benefit from being exposed to that technology on the production side. You know, we've heard about past disagreements when it comes to things like intellectual property. I'm curious, Linda, where is China now when it comes to technology, particularly as it relates to EVs? How sophisticated is that technology currently? As you mentioned, in the early days of China's automotive manufacturing, they've uh, relied on these foreign joint ventures a lot, where international brands like Ford and GM went into the China market and set up these um, production facilities together with the Chinese partners. And really, what's really interesting is that now that China has really grown its domestic electric vehicle industry, and along with that coming with the battery supply chain, it's kind of leapfrogged. Now you're seeing the foreign automakers having to turn to China to try to get some of that technological edge. We've seen Volkswagen tie up with Xpeng, which is an up-and-coming EV startup. We've also seen Stellantis um, forming partnership with another EV maker called uh, Leap Motor. So it's really interesting to see how the tide has turned. So you've got Neo, you've got Li Auto, you've got uh, Xpeng. BYD, the biggest name, I suppose. And now a new entrant, Xiaomi. I'm just curious, will we see much at this auto show in the coming week from Xiaomi? Yes, uh, Xiaomi will be exhibiting at the auto show. What's really interesting about Xiaomi is they've already had a major launch uh, a couple of weeks ago. And after that launch, the reception has been better than expected. Sales uh, kind of went through the roof. So I think at the auto show, it will be kind of another chance for Xiaomi to display its first EV, the Su-7. Linda just mentioned the auto supply chain, Danny. When it comes to very critical technology, lithium-ion batteries, I'm thinking of CATL in particular. We just heard from the company recently with its earnings report. To what extent does China dominate the battery space? Is this a slam dunk? I mean, no Nobody can compete against China right now when it comes to EV batteries? I think China's always had that head start in, in the battery space and doing it in a way in scale and identifying what it thought would be the future technologies. When you do look at the numbers, you do see China in particular having a grip on many aspects of the battery supply chain. And that's no coincidence thanks to this response to what they thought was the future in automotive being EVs. When you see someone like CATL uh, you know, performing so strongly uh, and it, you know, it seems to weather any kind of market conditions, clearly there is a cause con concern there because you know, when you want to have a, a level playing field, when you want to have more players, more diversity, and yet there is still more concentration, I think it's a big question mark over how governments respond to maybe even support their own kind of national champions in the battery space. Linda, as you know, uh, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen was recently in China, and one of the things that she criticized the government for was the, the subsidy, the role that subsidies play in supporting the industry. What do we know about how the government has supported the, the EV manufacturers and whether or not that has been, to, uh, to Yellen's point, maybe a little excessive? Yes, that's right. Uh, when Janet Yellen in China, the word that kept coming up was overcapacity and, you know, how the Chinese government subsidies have led to the situation. In the early days of the electric vehicle industry in China, the government has poured uh, tens of billions of dollars into growing and nurturing these companies. Now you've got success stories like BYD, CATL that have come from this government support. But in the past uh, few years, that support has been phased out as China enters kind of its next stage of EV adoption, which is more market driven. Now, I think uh, critics may point to that as unfair competition that these Chinese companies survived, so uh, probably mostly due to these subsidies. But um, 
on the other hand, you see US and the EU also now investing um, into their domestic industry. So it's kind of an interesting argument, uh, depending on which way you spin it. And we haven't talked too much about BYD, Linda, but BYD, you know, we made a lot of the fact that they were um, getting some mass market uh, cars uh, really out uh, across the country. But now we've just seen them double down on their expansion into luxury uh, SUVs. And I'm wondering what the impact of that might be and the competition that might provide to Tesla. Yeah, uh, last night, BYD just launched uh, more models from the upscale function bar brand. And uh, they're doing a lot more in the luxury space. And from the analysts that we've spoken to, they think um, these brands are probably not going to move a huge amount of volume. But what they do bring to the table for BYD is prestige. And having that prestige will just uh, lift BYD's brand up and help it to compete more in the kind of arena where Tesla is at. You know, Tesla has super passionate fans and they just really love the Tesla brand and BYD is trying to hit that way. We've heard of the, the potential threat of tariffs, not only from the US, but certainly from the European side too. Workers are very much uh, I think for both parties um, are top of mind when government officials try to defend their turf and keeping people employed. Danny, take me into the shop floor. If you look at the way some of these manufacturing uh, facilities are structured in China, when you get into EV manufacturing, are we talking about a great deal of workers or is a lot of this already automated that we're using uh, a heavy amount of robotics? Is that right? There is a uh greater reliance on automation and robotics and you can see the way in which the likes of BYD have some of the most efficient supply chains and it's you know you're, you're taking from the copybook of the likes of Tesla who's redefined the way in which uh, EVs cars are produced fundamentally uh, and and you can see and it's an astonishing kind of um, perspective when you look at when you go onto these kind of production lines and you see very few workers you know, you go for, you know, for up to a, know, a mile or more and you'd see handfuls of workers and all they're doing is fundamentally managing the machines, making sure that production is smooth, it can run automatedly and they'll just iron out any kinks. And so, you know, you, when you can get to that kind of level of efficiency, it is, you know, it clearly underscores your ability to, you know, be a successful uh, kind of company. And, and of course, when you see, uh, in somewhere like Europe or even in the US where working uh, in, in the automotive industry is highly unionized. You know, clearly people will be concerned about their jobs and, and how you pivot away from that into something more automated is very difficult outside of China. I mentioned in the intro about Chinese manufacturers looking to set up shop in Mexico. I just ask you in a very short question, perhaps a short answer as well, do you see Chinese manufacturers manufacturing in Mexico before the end of this decade? Yes. All right, we'll, we'll finish on that note. And that will definitely cue up a lot of tensions with the United States. If you think that those tensions are high with China and the EU, wait till you see a BYD a manufacturing cars in Mexico uh, for export to the United States. Danny, thanks so much for joining us. And Linda, Linda Liu as well, transport reporters here at Bloomberg. I'm Brian Curtis in Hong Kong, along with Doug Krisner. You can catch us every weekday for Bloomberg Daybreak Asia, beginning at 8 a.m. in Hong Kong and 8 p.m. on Wall Street. Tom? Our thanks to Brian and thank you to Doug. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend. Join us again Monday morning at 5 a.m. Wall Street time for the latest on markets overseas and the news you need to start your day. I'm Tom Busby. Stay with us. Top stories and global business headlines are coming up right now.